Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. I'm very interested in feeling the past. The jewel and the crown of this story is the fact that these objects help tell the story. What is this green burial? Is this how I can become a tree? Today on Spotlight, it was the first one built and it's the last one standing inside the Campbell House. Plus, the art and science of beer with Urban Chestnut. And then, behind the lens, celebrating female photographers. But first, a ghostly exhibit inspired by the history and architecture of St. Louis. It's Sunday and you're watching the Emmy Award winning Spotlight. I'm very interested in feeling the past, not only reading about it, not only watching movies about it, but actually feeling it, like touching the walls, sitting on the furniture. I'm projecting myself walking through the space. I'm kind of a ghost from the future in these old photographs. You know, I always think how they would feel about me being in their space and lying in their bed and <laughs> touching all their stuff. The photographs were taken when it was somebody's home and now I walk through it and it's a museum, so it's like this border between public and private. So this exhibition, Currents 119, Donna Levy, is part of the St. Louis Art Museum's ongoing Currents exhibition series, which features contemporary artists who are usually early to mid-career, and it gives them a chance to have a solo show at a major museum, kind of at an early stage of their development. The Currents program is an incredibly important part of the St. Louis Art Museum's contemporary art programming. It brings international artists to St. Louis, which allows artists to experience our city, but also allows the city to experience international art communities. Donna was part of an ongoing fellowship that we have that's a joint program with Washington University in St. Louis's Sam Fox School of Art, Architecture and Design. That's called the Henry L. and Natalie E. Freund Fellowship, where we bring international artists to St. Louis where they work with MFA students at the Sam Fox School for around two months, and then they have a current exhibition at the museum. Donna's work really deals with ideas of place, of migration, and of displacement. And she uses architecture, human history, the environment, and nature to kind of look at these issues across myriad locations. Oftentimes, she'll take a site as a starting point, or an archival source, or some aspect of deep research, and for this exhibition, she really looked at St. Louis and sites in St. Louis. I work mostly with video and installation. Sometimes I use found objects or found photographs. I discovered the Campbell House Museum just by chance, and I was amazed by how well preserved it was. And the thing that amazed me the most was these photographs that had been taken in 1885. The spaces are almost entirely the same like they were in 1885. A lot of the buildings around were like deteriorating and, you know, there were a lot of abandoned houses nearby and vacancy. And then here was this one house that was so well preserved. So I like that contrast. And this wall kind of divides the old neglected houses in North St. Louis and then this hyper preserved house. When I came there to North St. Louis, it looked like a bomb had been taken off there. And I was wondering why half the city is so preserved and half of it is so neglected. It made me think of this apocalyptic future where there are no more humans. So I brought these birds and reptiles in there and they're kind of flying in and out of the buildings as if no more humans are there. And then I also interviewed residents of North St. Louis and I asked them why it looks like this. And they told me about how their family's house is no longer there and how it slowly, gradually changed, like the factories closed down and drugs and all this stuff was brought in and of like this systematic racism that caused this. And I was thinking also about Cahokia, which is on the other side of the river. Cahokia 
used to be the largest city in the world between 950 and 1300s, but now it's just like a mound of grass. And it made me think maybe this is the direction that we are going in, this decline of civilization. And in the whole show, I kind of look at what is being preserved and what is being neglected and, and why. This free exhibit is on display through August 15th. Visit slam.org for more info. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You don't have to look hard to find this street's exception to the rule. For the past 76 years, this 168-year-old single-family home has been frozen in time, the last artifact of a once great neighborhood lost to time. It was the place to live in Gilded Age St. Louis. From the 1850s to the 1880s, Lucas Place was St. Louis's first private neighborhood. Expensive, exclusive, exquisite. And this house, the Campbell House at 1508 Locust, was the first one built and is the last one standing. In 1943, it was turned into a museum. We do think of this house as a gem because especially when you come inside, it just sparkles. When it was built in 1851, it was the smallest house in the neighborhood, about half the size of the behemoths around it. Still, it was big enough to hold eight bedrooms for the family and nine more for the staff, so they could be on call 24 hours a day. Robert and Virginia Campbell gave their modest mansion the look of a palace, covering almost every inch of its 10,000 square feet with Gilded Age extravagance. He paid about $12,000 for this structure. Over a six months period, they spent about $40,000 furnishing this house. We really think that was a sign that, you know, they had arrived. And when the last Campbell departed in 1938, a few civic-minded citizens were so worried about the fate of the house, they banded together and raised enough money to buy most of the Campbell's possessions. A large donation from the Sticks Baron Fuller department store was used to buy the building. The Campbell House Foundation has run it as a museum ever since. Just when they walk into this room in the parlor, they, they're kind of gobsmacked because when you walk into the museum, the doors to this room are closed. And we kind of do the big reveal. The pocket doors open and this double parlor with all its Rococo Revival furniture and its carving and gilding is revealed. And people say, how could you live in this room? It looks so uncomfortable. It's so cluttered. It's so crazy. Robert Campbell came to America from Ireland when he was just 19. A bookkeeping job with a fur trading company brought him to St. Louis, but it wasn't long before Campbell became a trapper himself, spending 10 years hunting beaver in the rugged Rocky Mountains. This is the story of Robert Campbell, mountain man. This 2018 BBC film documents that part of his life, but Campbell would go on to become a leading citizen of St. Louis, moving from selling furs to dry goods. He owned ships and ran banks. The Campbells did have 13 children, um, but there was never more than four of their children living at any one time. Scourges like cholera, measles, diphtheria, took 10 of those little ones who died before the age of eight. Only three lived to adulthood, all men and all bachelors. They refused offers to sell. They had enough money to maintain the building. It must have been a very weird feeling for them to grow up in this neighborhood. Imagine. Uh, in that Civil War era, it was leafy green and kind of very quiet and elegant. And by the 1920s, it was hustle and bustle, and they were the only ones left. Today, things are changing at the Campbell House for the better. Thanks to extraordinarily positive reviews on TripAdvisor, this past year, the museum saw a 40% increase in visitors. But what has not changed is that most of them are from out of town. What they'd really like to see here is more people visiting from here, learning about a remarkable family, a glorious home, and civic leaders who took action before time ran out. St. Louisans who've never been here are 
even worse, never heard of it, uh, are really missing an opportunity to learn about their city in the 19th century. And when you come down here to the Campbell House and get a tour, you get a very good sense of that. The jewel and the crown of this story is the fact that these objects help tell the story of this family. St. Louis, we're going through difficult, confusing, and often frightening times. But HEC Media is here for you in new and expanded ways with free educational resources. It is so in-depth. Critically acclaimed author interviews. Books save you, I think, if you're going through a bad time. Virtual art fairs. This allows our patrons to shop a variety of artists. Local COVID research. This is kind of a home run, a dream response to the vaccine. Fundraising for artists, virtual concerts, and much more. HEC is honored to help our arts and cultural communities survive and thrive, and to show you there is strength and hope in St. Louis. Evidence is growing about the fast-spreading coronavirus variants. The global scientific community is discovering that some COVID-19 variants can evade the immune response triggered by the COVID-19 vaccines and previous infection. What we observed um, over time as a field was that there started to accumulate changes in the spike gene, which is the particular gene which makes the protein that allows the virus to enter the cell but it's also the protein that's targeted by the immune system. With those changes, virologist Dr. Michael Diamond at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis and his colleagues started thinking about what's next. When this starts to happen, we begin to worry that the immune system response that we've generated, if a new variant comes along, the variant might actually be able to escape the immune response. In other words, the immune response would not work as efficiently. With the global effort to observe and follow changes in the sequence in the spike protein, Diamond stepped in to determine the significance. Three possibilities. One, the change could be neutral. There could be no effect. The other is the change could compromise the immune response uh, or evade it, or it could actually even make it better which is unusual, but in theory could happen. Getting specific answers about COVID-19 variants is a process. They had serum from humans that were vaccinated. And then in this particular experiment, and we took the serum from humans and then tested it against the variant viruses in cell culture systems. And what he discovered is concerning. Looking at variants from South Africa, the United Kingdom, and Brazil, Diamond's research indicates the three fast-spreading variants of the virus that causes COVID-19 can evade antibodies that are produced in response to COVID-19 vaccinations, natural infections, or purified antibodies intended for use as drugs. The most concerning variants that we're worried about, they really fall in two classes. The first class is the super highly transmissible variants, like the United Kingdom variant, which if you got infected with, even if you had a vaccine, maybe you're protected from severe disease, but it's possible you could still transmit that virus, meaning you don't have protection in your upper airway, you have protection in your lung, you have protection throughout your body, but you could still have some shedding in your upper airway. And then that virus could then be transmitted to people who are not yet vaccinated or those who get really poor vaccine responses because they're old or they're immunocompromised. So that's one type of variant. The other variant, which is concerning as well, are ones that accumulate mutations in the spike gene that directly evade the immune response, like in South Africa or in Brazil. Originally, they're, they're now throughout the world, and so they have number and nomenclature names like B1351 or B11248. These particular viral variants they may not, the immune response that you generate against the vaccine may not be as effective. So then what's the takeaway for everyone? People are getting vaccinated, but they're hearing that variants pose a threat. You absolutely want to get vaccinated because if you don't get any vaccine, you're not going to have any protection. And then you're going to be completely susceptible to some of these variants, which turn out to be even more transmissible and in some regards, more pathogenic. For the full story about Dr. Diamond's findings and what this means for you and future vaccines, go to our website, hecmedia.org.
My name is Florian Kuplent. I am brewmaster and co-founder at Urban Chestnut Brewing Company here in St. Louis. I basically do everything from writing the recipes, selecting the ingredients. We have people to help manage with the production, but I kind of oversee the brewing process. So there's two main types of beers. There are ales and there are lagers, and the difference is just in the types of yeasts that are being used. Lagers are typically fermented at lower temperatures and uh, mature for a slightly longer period of time. Ales are fermented at higher temperatures, and typically the process is not quite as long. It's very similar to cooking, where you select different ingredients and then combine them in a different way and, and hopefully come up with a, with a dish that you enjoy. So the four main ingredients for beer are water. Uh, water is actually the most important ingredient because it's typically 90% plus of the product is water. We use malt, which is for the most part barley that gets germinated and then dried. Uh, that results in a slightly sweet kernel that we then uh, use to uh, produce sugars that yeast ferments which brings us to the next ingredient, so to speak, that's yeast. It's a living organism that will consume sugar and produce alcohol and a bunch of flavors. And then the last ingredient is hops, and hops will provide some of the fruitiness, the bitterness for sure. It's really nuances. It's, it's, it's using ingredients that have different qualities, so uh, hops, there's hop, hop varieties that may be a little bit more herbal, spicy, citrusy, versus others that are more, taste more like grapefruit, um, have like a tropical flavor. So using those and adding those in different stages of the process, that makes a difference. We mill the malt, so we grind the malt up, and it gets uh, transported into this tank up top. Then we mash it in, we basically combine it with water it drops into this tank, then we pump it into the louder ton. That's uh, the tank that has a false bottom where we separate the liquid wort, the sugars, the sugary liquid from the spent grain, the husks. So mash is basically when we combine water and the milled malt. And malt at that point is mostly starch and starch is basically a large molecule that is made of sugar. Uh, yeast cannot consume starch, so we have to, to break the starch down, and uh, that happens during mashing. Malt contains naturally occurring enzymes, and those are molecules that will break down starch into sugar, and then uh, later on, once we've gone through the rest of the brew house process, that sugar then gets converted into, into alcohol. So it's kind of the first crucial step to get us to the final profile of the beer. You really have an impact on how that beer is going to taste by the first step that you're going through. Beer's been around for several thousand years and it's kind of interesting to look back and it, we're still essentially doing the same thing that brewers did 2,000 years ago. It must have always been a, a great combination of, of art and science even back then when science really wasn't uh, very developed, um, but they still knew what worked and they knew what they were able to do with certain processes and come up with a good product. There's a, there's a management aspect, there's the science aspect, there's the creative side, the art that gets gets imparted because it's all very open and, and uh, people are very happy to talk about what they are doing in, in, in their brewery. So it's it's uh, you, you you never stop learning and it's 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 a great way to kind of get be connected to the industry. A special way to honor those who have passed later on Spotlight. It's interesting just to see different styles within photojournalism. You have several, you have Margaret Berkway, you have Susan Mysalis, you have Lindsay Adario, and they all bring a different style to their photojournalism. Margaret Burke White is working primarily in film black and white, whereas you have Susan Mysalis who is working in color along with Lindsay Adario in color, but different kind of styles within their portraiture. This show is following women photographers from the mid 19th century until today we have a vast variety of the subject matter being shown from photojournalism to still life photography, and we have some really incredible female photographers shown. They're all have had a very big impact on photographic history. These female photographers were doing things that maybe weren't totally accepted during their time. And some of them were able to do things that maybe men weren't able to witness 
for example, Margaret Burke White, was able to make women comfortable while they're doing the work that they're doing for their country. She was the first female photographer with Life magazine, and she did a lot of their photojournalism. She covered things like World War II. She covered a lot of the women that were impactful in the war, following them in the industry where they were working. There's a vast variety of perspectives here. We do have photographers like Carrie Mae Weems. She is one of the most impactful photographers of our time today. She's covering works from African-American perspective and subject matter where maybe people are disenfranchised and commenting on those through her imagery. Olivia Parker's pieces, they're following her husband's Alzheimer's. I think it's the fallout after he's passed, but kind of her working through grief and following the progression of the disease, what he experienced. Ruth Barnard, she captured the female body and the figure in a way that men hadn't. Photographers like Lindsay Adario, she's a photojournalist. She works in places like the Middle East and where men wouldn't have access. Lindsay Adario does a lot of war photography and migration, fleeing from war. Susan Mysalis does a lot of war photography as well. Dorothea Lang's migrant mother. That's a really important photo to history covering the Depression era and kind of the mother's relationship there. That one is alongside Susan Mysalis's photo of a woman fleeing her hometown of Nicaragua because of the war. So those two images side by side, it's interesting to see the protection of their child, but very different circumstances. Nine of the 11 photographers shown here today have been inducted into the International Photography Hall of Fame. We honor photographers that have made a significant impact in the field. On display through May the 8th, 2021. Visit IPHF.org for more information. You can find the stories featured in today's show along with past episodes and more at hecmedia.org forward slash spotlight. Rory was a very soft-spoken man of few words. My dad was very kind. He had a huge heart. He was trained as a geologist, had the best sense of humor of anybody I know. For all his wonderful qualities, the one thing Rory Meyer was not was a planner. He was only 62 when he died and had never given any indication what he would want done with his remains. When my husband was in hospice, um, I told my daughter, I hate to say this, but we did not have that conversation and I have no idea what he wants. And, um, and I just felt that it needed to be something different than the traditional. After reviewing their options, Rory's family decided to handle his death in a way that reflected what he loved in life. So they gave him a green burial. I received a lot of telephone calls from people who just call up and ask, what is this green burial? Is this how I can become a tree? The short answer is sort of, and historic Bell Fountain Cemetery is the only St. Louis cemetery certified by the Green Burial Council. Green Burial has been around forever. If you really think about it, um, people have been burying green as long as people have been here on Earth. Green burial simply means caring for the dead with minimal impact on the environment. The body is buried in a biodegradable container, like a wicker casket or a simple shroud. There is no concrete vault and no embalming. Earth to earth, dust to dust. I thought that it was the exact thing for Rory. He was a lover of everything beautiful, art, music, all of nature and this seemed like the most natural. This, to me, feels far more organic and um, less like a ceiling of a coffin or a grave. Um, he's just in the ground and I don't feel so far away from him. 
At Bell Fountain, a person can be buried green in the main part of the cemetery with a headstone or without a marker in a part of the cemetery recently converted into a grassy prairie for the greenest burial of all. It is called Evergreen Meadow. We give them GPS coordinates so that they're able to find the location of their loved one. But really the idea is that their loved one is planted in this meadow space and then the meadow will grow up on and around them. So they're just a part of this ecosystem. And all night long you can hear him roar. Bring on the gosh darn cat. Along with being more environmentally friendly, Green burials are also more family friendly. In most cases, the deceased's loved ones blanket the body with greens and flowers picked for them at the cemetery before lowering and sometimes burying the body themselves. I told Gracie, I was just like, sign me up, put me right next to him. You know, let's do it all now so my kids don't have to think about it later. Yeah, so, so yeah, there's a spot for me. You can definitely rest in peace here, <laughs> for sure. For the Myers, coming to Evergreen Meadow is less like visiting a cemetery and more like going on a nature hike, where every flower and tassel and tree trunk makes them feel connected to Rory. I think um, the manner in which traditional burials are done is becoming a bit archaic and truly we can give back um, even after we're gone. It's the last thing you're doing for someone that you love. I think everybody that knew Rory knew that this was, you know, right for him. I know he would love this cemetery. If there are spirits that are roaming, I know he's roaming around, enjoying every bit of it. Next week, the science of getting older without getting old. Inside the book, Ageless. Plus, changing people's perceptions of cockroaches. Why you might decide to love these crawling critters. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.